This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Okay, bingo, we're back. That's Jeff Kissel over there. You can see him. And I'm Jay Fidel, and this is Energy in America. We explore, you know, the larger picture of energy in this country and beyond. And we so appreciate uh, Jeff coming around. Jeff, uh, why don't you tell us where you are today? Oh, Jay, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm glad you got my high school picture up there. It looks good. It's, it's a, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I am uh, working in uh, the East Coast today. I'm in New York City. And uh, I wish we were actually on video because the view from where I am is just spectacular. If, if I look west, I see the Empire State Building. It's a little after nine o'clock tonight at night and, and it's all lit up at the top with a rainbow of colors. If I look south, I can go look straight down Park Avenue where the, the, the avenue intersects Broadway and we can see the Freedom Tower in the distance. I look north to Grand Central Station and of course, I, you know, I, I look east out on, on the East River, and it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful sight. We're having Hawaii weather out here. So the only regret I have is that I brought my Aloha shirt 3,000 miles, and nobody gets to see it. <laughs> <clears throat> Next time soon, Jeff, we have to do this again. Uh, I'll be glad to. I'll be glad to. We'll, we'll do it live and direct from Central Park. Yeah, oh, that'd be great. I, you know, I really like live, and uh, and I like Manhattan. I like New York, and I left New York essentially in, uh, gee, 1965, and uh, I've only been back as a tourist since then. And uh, I must, I must say, it's uh, well. Actually, I came back for graduate school, so that's not entirely right. I left it for, finally in 1971, um, but I must say that uh, New York is a is such a pleasing place. There's so much there. That, there's so much, you know, nutrition in New York. And uh, so I envy you being there today. Well, it's, it's certainly a financial center. It, you know, as you may or may not know, it is the energy center in the world today where more oil, oil commodities, oil, natural gas, all of this material is traded and priced uh, right here in Manhattan. Um, you know, there, there are other centers, you know, Chicago and London and the like, but there's nothing to compare with the volume here. And, you know, we're fortunate that we're, you know, in Hawaii, we're, we're part of an economy that has access to these energy markets. Yeah. Um, North America is, is essentially, as you and I have discussed, it's now energy independent. And, of course, we're a big exporter of energy products gasoline, diesel, and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously coal as well. Yeah, and, and uh, Lou, uh, Lou Pugliarisi has told us uh, about the effort uh, to sell natural gas, uh, LNG, to Asia. And so we are an exporter in many ways and many different kinds of products. Um, and so, you know, I would have thought, if you asked me coal, I would have thought that the U.S. was not a major fuel production the, or the major fuel production center in the world, um, but that's not true. It is the number one uh, fossil fuel production center in the world right now today. Um, not the Middle East, not any place else, but the U.S. How do you like that? Well, I like it better and better when you consider that the U.S. is also the number one renewable energy producer in the world. People don't realize that. There, are, there, there is more renewable energy produced in the continental United States by any measure than anywhere else on earth. And it and that supply is growing. It's growing in a place like California, which is the number two energy producing state, fossil fuel producing state in in mm -hmm. the uh, 50 states. Yeah. So it, it's really quite something. Well, I think what's, what's interesting is that the capital powers, the capital investment organizations in the country or centered or headquartered in the country, probably in Manhattan, all of them, um, you know, recognize that uh, more, the more energy you have in a given country or jurisdiction, the better the economy is going to be. That, you know, that, that would seem clear as a matter of fundamental economics, but 
It's, it's somehow become all the more clear these days, don't you think, with the U.S. especially. If we have more energy, we do better in our economy. Well, it, it's one of the factors that got us out of the Great Recession a lot sooner than the rest of the world economy, because we, we floated to prosperity on a sea of oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids from the natural gas revolution in the Permian Basin and the other regions in the United States. And that fact will be discussed for decades to come as, as we analyze what's going on in the energy sector in, in North America. Is it, is it fair to say that the Trump administration has had a salient effect on this over the last 18 months, or, or has it been happening anyway, you know, regardless of uh, what efforts he may be uh, exercising? Well, it really started, and, and, you know, the Energy Policy Research Foundation is not political and not partisan. So, we're, you know, we look at this from um, an economic perspective and, and the physics. It really started earlier than that. It started really during the, the Bush administration when unconventional gas was, was first developed. And it continued on through the Obama administration, and now it, it continues. Now, certainly, the Obama administration and the Trump administration, with their energy policy, have influenced the process, and they've influenced in many directions. But the, the underlying trend is economic. It, it really is not political. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me turn to the subject you and I were going to discuss, and that is the energy relationship, if you will, between... Alaska, interestingly enough, and Hawaii. Uh, what is that relationship? How does that work, and how does it benefit us? Well, Jay, you know, not to put a, a too fine a point on it, but if you stand out on your front porch and look almost due north, you will see Sarah Palin's porch. <laughs> the the Alaska-Hawaii trade route is critically important, and it has been for many, many years. Um, Alaska developed the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, as we all know, in the 1970s. And it exported, at, at one point, over a million and a half barrels a day of crude oil. Now, that's down by about two-thirds as the resource is being uh, fully uh, deployed and exploited. Uh, but that doesn't mean that Alaska is any less important to Hawaii. You and I were both around when... The, the Alaska oil workers used Hawaii as an R&R &R base during, during the 70s. And I think we're both old enough to remember when Western Airlines flew from Honolulu to Anchorage and then on to London. And a very important link in the energy supply chain is the North Sea, Alaska, and other Pacific uh, destinations were being developed for oil production. Well. If you look at my slide pack and, and you, you go to slide two, you actually see that Alaska West Coast and Alaska Hawaii trade route. It is critically important for Hawaii's energy future. I want to make a point that you and I have made previously, but I think it's important to set the context again for this show. Hawaii has decided that oil will be its bridge to its renewable energy future. It has, it has eliminated, effectively, the gas. It has eliminated the option for natural gas. And it, it has effectively eliminated coal as a source of energy to get through the oil era to hopefully what will be uh, the state's goal of, of a more or less renewable energy future not dependent upon fossil fuels. Now, I'm saying that because it's the fact. It's, it's not something we believe is right or wrong. But in order to do that, Hawaii needs inexpensive oil. Mm -hmm. And if, if you look at the line between Hawaii and Alaska, you will see that the trade route is there. It's all established. The infrastructure is, a lot, is established. The only thing we need, of course, is oil. If you go to slide three, you'll see that I point out that Hawaii, both of Hawaii's refineries 
were built or modified so that they run best on Alaskan-type crude oil. Both of them run best on a mix of Alaskan and other low-sulfur crude oil. That produces the least costly gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and power plant fuel for Hawaii. The important point here is not that you should or shouldn't use fuel. The important point here is that if the Hawaii economy is going to have enough money to invest in its renewable energy future, it needs to get its energy today from the least costly sources. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I grew up understanding, I grew up in energy understanding that we were using uh, LSO oil from Indonesia. Is that not so? Uh, or is that just oh, part of this mix you described? It's, it's part of the mix. The low sulfur fuel oil for the power plant is an, a very important part of the mix. And that came originally from Hawaii's refinery. It then, as the crude oil blend changed, it was more economical to bring it in from Indonesia. It is now more economical to make it domestically if we can get the crude oil. Mm -hmm. and the reason for that is that low sulfur fuel oil is in much higher demand because the International Maritime Organization has mandated the use of low sulfur fuel oil in ships. And so it's no longer going to be available at an economic price outside of Hawaii. Ah, so so the, the whole idea is, is to keep the cost of production, keep the cost of energy down, obviously maintain a, a policy where we, we encourage conservation. Nobody is arguing with, with that. But then while we're, we're trying to wean ourselves away from hydrocarbon, we got to have the least costly hydrocarbon so we can invest in our renewable energy future. Okay, but so we, we, we now have LSO that's going to be in greater demand because of this uh, change from, what did you say, the IMO? Um, and, and as a result, um, you know, that element, that, that part of the mixture that comes from Indonesia or elsewhere, which is LSO, low sulfur oil, is going to be more expensive. How can you maintain... Uh, a cheaper source of, of oil uh, if, if this uh, part of the mix, this LSO part of the mix, is getting more expensive? Well, we want to, in order to do that, you know, we, we've got to try and buy it wholesale. And the way you buy oil wholesale is to bring it in as crude oil and refine it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, at slide four, you will see that, that there is a source for additional Alaskan oil. And it is being developed, and that is the Alaska National Wildlife Reserve, uh, section 2,000 acres out of 19 million uh, in northern Alaska that is being opened up for development that has the potential to produce nearly a million barrels a day of low sulfur Alaskan crude oil that can move down the already existing Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Trans-Alaska Pipeline is running at about one third of its original capacity. So there's, there's plenty of capacity to bring the oil down. There's plenty of oil to come down, we believe. And the, the ports, the shipping facilities, and the receiving facilities in Hawaii are already in place. Now, people are concerned, and I, I understand that I'm very sympathetic to the, the potential for environmental damage from the development of oil resources. But the point is, this resource is already developed. It's already in place. Mm -hmm. Building new pipelines, installing new port facilities, building new breaker walls, sea walls, and, and shipping lanes all have a risk. These risks have already been dealt with, mitigated, and in large part are cost-effective ways to use the resources we need while we're developing our renewable energy future. Well, Jeff, if this is, such, if this is uh, so you know, easy to do, existing infrastructure, existing systems and routes for the oil, and existing you know, demand for the oil, and that really hasn't changed all that much, 
Um, why haven't we done it before? Is this something we're doing now? Or is this something, you know, that we will hope to do later? Uh, what's, what's the timeline on what you describe? Well, the Trump administration is committed to opening uh, this particular 2,000 acre piece to um, oil exploration and, and drilling. I believe, uh, and the Energy Policy Research Foundation sent a couple of studies, they're available on our website, that it is certainly worth public debate. We, you know, we, we, again, we're not advocating one position or another. We're calling everyone's attention to the fact that you've got billions of dollars worth of infrastructure that could be utilized so that we don't have to develop new infrastructure with the inherent costs and risks and concerns that we would in order to bring this oil to Hawaii and the West Coast uh, through other means. So these fields then, these fields are fields that were not available before. These fields were for one environmental ruling or consideration uh, or another were not available to, to oil developers um, to bring the oil down through the what, Prudhoe Bay and the pipeline uh, and to Hawaii. So this is, this is a new source of, um, of, of Alaskan crude then. Huh? That is correct. Now the, the Alaskan uh, Natural Wildlife Reserve was set aside by Congress and the administration years ago as a, a pristine natural reserve. And I think it was a noble thing to do. It was entirely proper to do. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is it worth taking a look at exploring oil resources on 2,000 of 19 million acres? And that's a, a matter for policy debate. I'm, I'm, I'm not entering into it. I'm pointing out, as, as we do at the foundation, that the benefits of producing oil at $15 a barrel, up to a million barrels a day, are enormous compared to the cost of getting that oil from elsewhere in the world, perhaps again from economies and countries whose political systems do not have the same interests mm -hmm. as our own. Mm -hmm. Well, have you, you look at, at, go ahead. Have you done an analysis of, of how much savings would be involved using this source as opposed to another? For example, you know, suppose uh, uh, Donald Trump was not in office. Uh, suppose the EPA took an, another view of this and uh, was, you know, going to protect this environment in northern Alaska near the Arctic Circle and um, not, not permit development of oil in this area as, you know, as, as had been the case in the past and would not open these fields. Uh, What's the difference between that arrangement, sort of the status quo as before, um, plus the new fields in terms of price to Hawaii? Have, have you made an analysis of that? How much do we save? Well, we actually have. And if you, if you look at our website, we've got a lot of data. But the, the fundamental is this. Alaskan oil costs about $15 a barrel to produce. It costs about two and a half dollars a barrel to transport. The impact to the economy is a, a positive fourteen and a half billion dollars. It it will save jobs in Hawaii. It will preserve jobs in Alaska. And so those those numbers are pretty compelling. Today, if we can bring in oil for around $60 a barrel um, and produce the low sulfur fuel oil from that, it's a lot cheaper than the $200 a barrel that we have to pay to get that oil out of Indonesia, Singapore, where we have to compete for it against the people who are running ocean-going vessels who need it for their, their fuel. So. Oh, yeah. So, OK, so we would, we would save because it, would, it costs more going forward in Indonesia, especially given the supply and demand curve in the future. But, uh, you know, let me ask, you know, just, you know, so th this interests the oil development community. And of course, it, you know, to a certain degree, it's, uh, it's obviously of some help in our efforts here to save money on, on, electric, on, on energy and car and, and car operation. 
But um, the thing that uh, I wanted to ask you is, is suppose Trump is not reelected, um, and, and that possibility exists. You know, we have a, a, a very contentious political environment right now, and who knows what exactly will happen in the midterm elections or in the elections in 2020. And uh, so if I'm an investor out of those, uh, those big oil companies in New York, the ones you're standing right nearby, um, and I'm trying to look down the pike on this and decide whether to spend billions of dollars in developing you know, these, these oil resources and transport systems, uh, and I'm not sure that he's going to be in office that long, and I worry that you know, if the Democrats get back in there and, and take another, you know, re and try to return to the old environmental model, and not use this oil in these fields, uh, what, what happens then? Uh, so how can uh, capital investment sources who would invest in the development of oil in Alaska for the benefit of Hawaii and elsewhere, how can they model their future when they don't know uh, what will happen politically? And political is the operative word, I think, when you're talking about developing oil fields in northern Alaska. Well, I, I don't know either, but I do know that the way the legislation is being structured, the, the administration in power, or in office rather, um, will not have that much to do with it once the die is cast. And that's because everybody in Congress, Democrat and Republican, recognizes you cannot strand billions of dollars worth of investment and have an American economy that functions properly. Mm -hmm. It just... That can't happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm optimistic that the, and I, I, again, I have no opinion and I'm not offering a political advocacy for the development of ANWR or the development of any other resource. Uh, I, I can only tell you what the economics are. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that if we can get it developed, it will allow Hawaii to escape from the the, the jaws of this uh, impending crisis in the availability of power generation fuel. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it is a natural trade route that's been in place now for half a century between Hawaii and Alaska. The, the ships are built, the ports are configured, the workers are there. It's good jobs, good energy, and if Hawaii is wise in its energy policy, and I, I commend the state government for being wise the last 25 years, it will use that money to continue to invest in, in a diversified renewable energy structure mm -hmm. that is not dependent upon oil. Well, take, take one look with me, one further look with me at the possibility that there is a shift in, I want to call it public opinion and thus uh, the political winds in the next few years after, for example, we rely heavily on this possibility and we invest billions in it. And now, you know, the, now, the, now the switch turns the other way. How much trouble would it be to go through the investment um, to, you know, put this infrastructure down, to set up these, uh, you know, these, these uh, supply lines, if you will, uh, and, then, and then change it later and stop it? Well, I will tell you that the oil industry is a very sophisticated industry, and they have been putting their capital at risk essentially for about 125 years. And I think that they are doing it in a, in a way that will allow the industry to survive comfortably. But unfortunately, the consequences to Hawaii will be terrible because you will see oil prices go up so dramatically that you'll be paying roughly a dollar a kilowatt hour because of the, the cost of fuel in the power system. And that is crushing to the Hawaii economy. You and I both remember what happened to the economy um, in the early part of, of this century when oil prices spiked well above $100 a barrel. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just crushed the economy. Yep. So I, I hope that whatever administration is in office takes into account the fact that even though it is, it is a noble cause to protect the environment, and we should, there, are, there is a cost to it, 
and the costs have got to be weighed against the benefit. Yeah, one more thing comes to mind in our remaining couple of minutes, uh, Jeff, and I wanted to, this is an old question, and it's a question that came up when uh, LNG was under consideration here in Hawaii. I'm sure you remember um, that, that people were saying LNG, um, as we have discussed today, would be a bridge, a bridge to, um, you know, renewable fuels, a bridge to 100% renewable back down the line. Um, so the, the, the process that you and I have been discussing, the opening of these fields and the building investment and building in infrastructure, um, you know, will we'll provide um, a lower price for fossil fuel to Hawaii. Let's accept that. The question is whether we can still manage a bridge. Because once you have put the investment in, then those who invested it would like to you know, earn a return from it as long as they possibly can. And to, uh, you know, to tell them in, say, 10 or 15 years, stop, stop, boys. We don't want to you know, use the benefit of that investment anymore. They will probably just, you know, at the time it happens, they will resist that. And thus, you have resistance to using this as a bridge. Uh, rather, you have a, a certain swell of support for using it forever. And, uh, and that, would, that would impede, you know, acceptance of renewable fuels, wouldn't it? So my question to you is, how can we be sure that a bridge will really be a bridge? Well, you, you've got a bridge right now, and it's oil. Because you, you, by not looking for another bridge, you have defaulted to oil. And that's, that's what it is. So uh, today, if you go to my slide six, the statistic is very simple. Hawaii's got about 20% renewable energy in its economy. Every electric car on the street runs on 80% oil. That's, that's a fact. Can't, <laughs> can't dispute it. That's an interesting analysis, yeah. <laughs> so so the, the bridge is oil. It's a slippery bridge. It, <laughs> without devastating natural gas, I thought it was a better bridge. But... Public policy is what it is. It couldn't agree on anything different. So we've got 50-year-old, 70-year-old refining assets, 100-year-old oil pipelines and tanks in the harbor, and that's what Hawaii is running on today. And, and that's, I, I can't change it. It's, it's just what it is. So if you look at my slide seven, you see the economic benefits of bringing this oil in from Alaska our, our new production, lower cost, and more jobs. Now, we, we, can't, we can't make people do this, but we can certainly point out the economic state we're doing. Yeah, let's take a look at slide seven for a moment, and then we'll have to, uh, we'll have to say farewell. Yeah, okay, economic benefits. Uh, 980,000 barrels per day of production, and $15 per barrel to produce, and that would create a benefit. So assuming that this all happens in the way that you, know, you, you, you describe, and that we'll be able to get uh, relatively cheap oil from Alaska and uh, make an appropriate mix of LSO and satisfy our demand in that way, um, when will we see gas at the pump you know, less? When will we see the benefits of this uh, economic economic benefit and reduction well yeah, you've already you're already seeing it california pays more for gasoline than hawaii but the real benefit will be when you can run an electric car on a hundred percent renewable energy instead of eighty percent oil and twenty percent renewable energy mm -hmm. that's the benefit and that i hope will will come about because we're using lower cost oil and saving that money and investing it in our renewable energy future. Yeah, so the whole scenario you describe assumes what you said at the outset, is that you have to take the money that you are saving and apply it to the development of renewable resources. And that's the critical point, and that requires legislative intention, uh, attention and uh, intention, uh, and, uh, and, and a long view on making the one work with the other. I think it's a really critical and point. Correct. And if you're sending that money off to Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or, or elsewhere, 
you don't even have the money to make that choice. Mm -hmm. If you're sending it to Alaska at a lower cost than Singapore, the money is there, and at least the policymakers have the ability to make the choice and choose to invest. I hope they get it, and I hope you come on the show again to discuss this very point again. And I look forward to that time, Jeff Kissel, E. Prink, talking about energy policy research. That's really valuable. Aloha, Jay. Aloha, Jeff. Next time soon. Take care.